Hey everybody, this week we are going to take a look at chapter six in our book around prescriptive analytics. Um, we'll take a look at uh, the first half of this chapter um, and then we'll, we're breaking it into two and uh, then take care of the second half of this chapter next week. Getting started here, we're going to talk about model-based decision making. So we're going to <clears throat> take a look at some data that we've gathered in, throughout this process and figure out uh, what kind of uh, some kind of a model uh, to that is representative of what it is that we're trying to do. So we are going to start with the concept of prescriptive analytics, and this is that making a decision out of some kind of a model that we've created in some analytic platform. For our purpose for this course, we are just going to use Excel, uh, a product that we're all relatively familiar and comfortable with, to be able to do what it is that we need to do. Descriptive and predictive analytics creates that foundation, um, some alternatives, some options that we may have, and that feeds into our prescriptive analytics where we're going to prescribe or say or inform what the best possible decision is based on the data and the um, characteristics of uh, and constraints of what we have uh, in front of us. So the descriptive and the predictive lead to the prescriptive. So we want to, an example of this is maybe maximizing the profit on optimal spending on marketing and some other kind of service pricing promotions. Some of the big issues that we often encounter with prescriptive analytics is identifying the actual problem and understanding the environment in which we are doing our work making sure that we are collecting as much information about what's needed, what's required, what's requested, and what in the world is going on uh, around our, our data, our company, or the world for that matter, um, can help us with uh, <clears throat> making sure that we set up our model correctly. Variable identification, these influence how our diagram or any other mapping that we do works. And a variable is something that can be changed uh, the number of items that we're going to produce or the optimal cost of an item. Uh, those could be different variables. The forecasting is always a little bit difficult. You can't always predict the future. Um, if we could, we probably would maybe be playing the lottery or something else and um, not maybe not doing uh, some our day jobs or something like that. So the forecasting is of course difficult, but the more information that we have about what happened in the past, the better idea we're going to have about predicting the future or the closer we may be to actual outcomes. And multiple models can be difficult. Multiple people running different models or a mo a one person running different types of models can be problematic. Um, and really what we need to do with all of those is to view all models that we may be using together to, I, to see if we can identify some general direction or, or some general pattern. Each model may be showing us something slightly different. So we want to make sure that we um, are taking all of them into consideration or sticking with one that we know is kind of tried and true for our company. Um, <clears throat> all of the models, just like data, must be maintained. So we don't typically share these, um, some of the models out to other folks in the business who may decide to tinker and then we find that with some shadow IT out there folks are using the models in ways they weren't designed to to be used and and potentially making decisions off of data that's incorrect because that model may not have been uh, ideal for that particular situation. We do a knowledge-based modeling where we have decision support usually helps us with our quantitative models and we have expert systems uh, as well. An expert system would be something that contains um, specialized data around a, a particular topic. So if we just have a knowledge base in our help desk, that may not be a specialized uh, expert system. An uh, expert system might be something that the, ana the analysts use or uh, somebody doing quantitative, qualitative modeling may use uh, just to make sure that they keep all their information and their data correct their assumptions are, are documented. So an expert system uh, is a, a particular system geared towards one uh, facet of our business or, or one type of job. And it's really where uh, ideally kind of a brain dump happens. 
some of the current trends in modeling, just like with everything else these days, it is a, a focus towards cloud-based modeling, uploading all of your data into some cloud model and then it's spitting out the answer. Um, and and I don't notice of any difference between using a cloud-based modeling tool versus something that's installed locally on your computer. Sometimes the cloud ones have more access to data and may produce a better outcome. Uh, and sometimes that extra data becomes noise because it may not be relevant, but it was included in the model, so you have to be careful. Uh, and the uh, transparent models, multi-dimensional visual models, instead of just spitting out numbers, they may start um, to produce graphs um, and other types of visualizations that could help in that decision making. And influence diagrams, these are here to build and solve our models. Um, they can help us set up our inputs, they can help us um, with the direction we may want to go, but they also can sort of be guiding in a way that maybe we didn't anticipate uh, our, our model shifting. I have a couple of categories here and something else in another slide a little later that I'm not going to go through specifically, but I think you need to pay attention to some of these categories of the models. Um, and what we're going to be doing um, throughout this class is uh, a little bit of optimization, a little bit of uh, prescription based on um, some some input scenarios. So kind of a little bit more of the heuristics here where we're going to find the best possible solution um, using uh, some set of rules. It also is a bit of simulation. We're going to come up with the best possible solution amongst all of the items that we present um, using an experiment. And we're going to have the computer run the experiment for us. Uh, otherwise, we could be there all day trying to do it. Some of the modeling that we'll be doing is a mathematical model. This, however, is not a math-related course, so please don't be worried that you're going to have to remember a whole bunch of math models. In this slide and the next, I'm going to take a look at some models, uh, and I think they could be ones that you've experienced before. Uh, they're very, very simple. So what we're trying to do is either look at a non-quantitative model, qualitative. When we think of quantitative, we think of typically numbers or facts that we can verify. Qualitative usually can, uh, refers to data that is a little bit more subjective and less objective. Qualitative data could be around how people are feeling, that sentiment analysis. It could be around um, what people are, are thinking or, or doing versus uh, sales trends or something like that, which would be more of a quantitative model. So we'll take a look primarily for our example in our homework at sticking with quantitative models <clears throat> using numbers. That's just going to be a little bit easier for us to track and work with. You may use these in a whole bunch of different areas. I don't think there's a particular industry on the planet that doesn't use some kind of modeling, mathematical or not, to understand the world and to predict where the business is going to go. Um, for ours, we'll look at a couple of a, a couple of these um, for our example, and then a different one for our homework. So, a structural uh, the structure of a mathematical model. This some of these I hope are not brand new to you. How do we calculate profit? Um, profit usually designated with P equals revenues minus the cost or expense. You may see revenue minus uh, R minus C or R minus E, depending on the book, but it's usually uh, how much you sell something for, and then you subtract how much it costs to make, produce, or buy, what have you. Um, and an example of this might be that um, we have an interest rate, so our mathematical model gets a little complicated here, where profit um, may equal whatever future money we think we're going to get uh, over whatever interest rate times the number of years. And so our profit for some specific item here could be just under, uh, just over $62,000. And our, our model for our assignment isn't going to include any interest rate. It's relatively straightforward and relatively simple, but profit equals revenues minus expenses is exactly what a mathematical model is, however, however simplified it actually is. So how do we model under uncertainty or certainty or risk? Um, if we're absolutely certain we're modeling under certainty, we have complete knowledge. Let's face it, we never have complete knowledge. We might think we have a great idea, great understanding, but it's unlikely that in any situation you would ever have perfect knowledge. 
Uh, you would also have all potential outcomes known and you may yield an optimal solution. This one, certainty is really difficult on which, under which to model because <clears throat> absolute certainty or perfect information never really exists. Uncertainty, uh, several outcomes for each decision. Uh, we can have a probability. So uh, we won't be working with probabilities in our, in our situation. When we look at our homework assignment, we're actually gonna model it under certainty information that's known and won't change. And under uncertainty, the probability of each outcome is, is unknown. So there's a likelihood that something could go a specific way and the knowledge would lead to less certainty. And then we have our last one, the risk analysis. Um, this is probabilistic, and this will take in some more probabilities of each item and what could happen if our model goes a bunch of different levels. Um, and you're probably more likely in the future would be doing any modeling under uncertainty with a risk analysis component to that. What is the likelihood that something may happen? There's some zones of decision making here. Everything in the world is, is, is really on a scale. Uh, complete certainty and knowledge and then uncertainty on the other side with any level of risk in the middle. The less you know, the more certain you may make your model. Uh, the more you know, I'm sorry, the, the more certain you may make your model and the less uh, to the other side, to the right, to the uncertainty side. Uh, you will likely be somewhere in the middle. There are things that you do know about the market or the world or other forces. Um, but again, it's pretty unlikely that we're ever going to have perfect information. What are some of the tools? Well, there's a whole bunch of tools. What we're going to use is good old Excel. So the most popular modeling tool is Excel. There's a whole lot of other ones. Um, if you're using a spreadsheet, uh, there's certainly other tools that are more popular than using a spreadsheet. But we're going to use Excel. If you're using Lotus 1, 2, 3, um, I, I have no idea how to help you. I didn't know anybody was still doing that, but the book does mention it. So I thought I'd throw it in here. Um, this will prove to be a pretty simple tool for us. So moving forward, the optimization via mathematical programming. And that's what we're going to be doing uh, for our activity and our assignment for this, this, this week. The mathematical programming of, is a family of tools to help you with your managerial problems. Um, the decision maker is going to has to allocate, so your manager, you, what have you, has to allocate scarce resources to be able to buy something or make something, produce, what have you, and then optimize some measurable goal. Well, in business, we typically like to optimize and maximize our profit and minimize our expenses. So those may be our goals. We also have scarce resources. So we only have so many labor hours. We only have so many inputs to produce our widget. So we have to uh, work within those scarce resources as well. The optimal solution is the best possible solution to, the, to our modeled problem. And how we're going to achieve that for us is through our friend, linear programming. This is a mathematical model for the optimal solution given all of the resources and constraints that we throw at the model. Uh, linear programming is, is fascinating, and I, I hope that you find our activity and our assignment uh, intriguing. There's, there's lots of use cases for linear programming. Some of the characteristics of linear programming, limited quantity of economic resources. Again, just to my example a moment ago, you only have so many labor hours. There's only so much money. You only have so many parts to produce what it is that you're trying to build. You're making iPhones, you only have so many screens, there's not an unlimited number of screens, there's only a limited number of chipsets and, and so forth from, from there. Um, resources are used in the production. So this is, even if you're doing a service, um, there are resources that go into the production of that service, typically labor. Two or more ways, solutions to use the resources. So there's a couple different ways that we could change the number of variables that are going into our model, which could produce different outcomes of the product that we're making. And each goal, activity, whatever it is, product or service, yields a return um, towards our, our goal of how many whatever items we wish to produce. And the allocation is usually restricted by constraints. Again, those constraints are labor hours or parts that go into something, um, number of factories, perhaps, are all constraints we'd have to consider. What we do first is identify all the variables. 
And then we object, we look at any coefficients. So we might think of uh, every one item produced um, has, if you produce one item of this, it, it, you can only produce half item of another, things along those lines. And constraints, we have our capacities, for instance, as well as maybe our, our inventory of parts. Represent the model. Um, we will write out the mathematical formula. We're going to do that in Excel, kind of make it a little easier. So we're going to combine those models um, in both of those, Lindo and Excel, together uh, because it's just easier to do it straight into Excel. And then we run the model and see what's going to happen. A couple of different types of optimization models that are pretty common. There's an assignment. This is the best matching of any objects in our model. Dynamic programming, goal, investment, linear, which is what we're going to do. Network models for planning and scheduling, um, nonlinear replacement, inventory, and transportation. Uh, we will do one of these uh, in another video that is posted here for our um, uh, practice. And then we'll use a different kind of one of these optimization models uh, as an assignment. The assignment is going to be posted on D2L just as always. Uh, there is no accompanying file. You will set up the model yourself in Excel. So if you're looking for anything, um, you'll have to watch the video and set it up with me. And then for the assignment, uh, you'll get um, uh, the assignment will have a list of constraints that you have to do and sort of figure out where they need to go in the model. Quick week this week, uh, just setting up the linear programming. And again, this could take a little bit of time. So spend some time in Excel and then we will pick up next week with the other half of this chapter. Thank you very much.